dollar for our law school. So I flew into D.C., turned off my phone, and obviously as soon as we landed, I, I turned my phone back on. Uh, 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 uh. I'm thinking, what is going on? My phone has been flooded with these messages. The guy next to me, he, I know he was wondering what is w- wrong with this guy. But this phone was just going crazy, and as I finally got to, uh, it stopped vibrating long enough for me to catch the, the notes. What had happened is that one of the students, uh, a senior, uh, was leading singing in chapel that day. And he found out about the health of my dad. My dad was very sick in March and eventually passed later in that month. And uh, he found out about it. And so after he led singing in chapel that day, he said, he told the, his fellow students what he had heard about the president's dad. He said, let's love bomb the president. Hundreds, I mean hundreds of message, text messages saying, we'll pray for you. It's humbling to be a part of an institution that attracts that caliber of uh, young man and young woman that really do uh, are purposeful in their lives for Jesus Christ. And so I feel very blessed to be at Falcon. Uh, have you ever heard of the concept, the devil's bargain? The devil's bargain, at least in my mind, is a concept where you don't really ask a lot of me, and I won't ask a lot of you. And and we're going to see this played out in Scripture. In fact, we're going to go to a text, a text that is literally millenniums old. And yet, after reading it, it's like a lot of Scripture. When you read Scripture, you realize that although the stories are hundreds and maybe even thousands of years old, they're contemporary. And they're relevant today in 2016. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 24 is where I want to start today. And really look at a text, and it's a really kind of an intriguing kind of encounter between Moses and God. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, I'll start there. This is God speaking to, to Moses. He says, set out now and cross the Arnon Gorge. See, I've given into your hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his country. Begin to take possession of it and engage him in battle. This very day I'll put the very terror, the terror and fear of you on all the nations under heaven. They'll hear reports of you and they'll tremble and be in anguish because of you. Okay, you got the picture. God says, Moses. Take him. Engage him in battle. That's why I underlined in my, my Bible. Engage him in battle. That's, that's the, what God is commissioning Moses. Now let's listen to Moses' response, starting in verse 26. From the desert of Kedmoth, I sent messengers to Sihon, king of Heshbon, offering peace and saying, let us pass through your country and we'll stay on the main road. We'll not turn aside to the right or to the left. Sell us food to eat and water to drink for your price of silver, and only let us pass through on foot, as the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir, and the Moabites, who live in Ar, did for us, until we cross into the Jordan, into the land the Lord our God is giving us. You see the disconnect? God says, engage him in battle. Moses said, let's compromise. God says, conquer him. Moses said, I got a better plan. You know, my plan means no casualties. It means we're going to walk through the land. We're not going to bother anybody. They're not going to bother us. In fact, we'll even buy some of their goods. No casualties, no bloodshed. We get on the other side. My plan sounds better than God. God picks up with the story. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 30. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, refused to let us pass through. For the Lord your God has made his spirit stubborn and his heart obstinate in order to give him into your hands as he has now done. The Lord said to me, See, I have begun to deliver Sihon and his country over to you. Now begin to conquer and possess the land. And when Sihon and all his army came out to meet us in battle at Jahaz, The Lord our God delivered him over to us and we struck him down together with his sons and his whole army. 
the Israelites, led by Moses, at this point in his life, didn't have a heart to trust God. But God forced, hardened Sihon's heart and forced them into a battle. They didn't really want to fight. But at the end of the day, Moses and the Israelites conquered more than Sihon that day. They conquered their fear. And as a result of fighting a fight that they were unwilling to fight, they realized something much more important, that God really could be trusted, and they really could believe what he said. They conquered Sihon, but they also conquered their fear. I don't think this is a text that gives us proof to wage holy war on non-believers or hunker down in Christian foxholes. But I believe it's a reflective passage that really offers some challenging questions. Are there battles that we currently avoid? Are there things in our life that we just assume not engage in? just pass down through the middle. We all battle addiction. Really. Some are avoiding some of the obvious ones, like substances and things like that. But many of us are addicted to our jobs. We're addicted to things. We're addicted to our own self-desires. God has called us to a mission of reconciliation. Is there a disconnect between what God is calling us to do and what we are car- how we are carrying out the mission? Are there relationships in our lives that need to be mended? Is it just a lot easier to avoid that than really to be reconciled to one another? Scripture tells us that we're aliens and strangers in this land. Are we just like the Israelites that just like to pass through and get to death's door safely? Or are we really called to do something engaging with the culture? Are we involved in the devil's bargain? Where we ask little of ourselves and hope that nobody really asks difficult questions of ourselves? This story really asks some difficult questions penetrating questions for us Um, it reminds us that fear many times is debilitating and if we're honest we've all let fear cripple us fear sterilizes people it sterilizes everybody and everything it comes in contact with we've all let fear drive us nuts now let's pick up Moses's life a little bit later down the path and you see Moses in a whole different perspective probably shaped by this experience at Sihon let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 7 as you know Moses uh, his eventual successor is Joshua and so Joshua is given the reins and he's going to lead the Israelites into the promised land and so uh, Moses makes this statement to Joshua 31 verse 7 uh, we'll start there then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land the Lord swore to their forefathers to give to them. You must divide it among them as their inheritance. Now here has become one of my favorite verses. The Lord himself goes before you, and he'll be with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. And do not be discouraged. Now this is not the same Moses that negotiated with Sihon. Moses is now much more awakened to the God that has been there since the beginning. Later we see Joshua picking up the reins and leading the people into to Israel. And you remember the story. They send the spies into Jericho, the fortified city. The spies, they go in, they find to, to spy out the land before they take it. And uh, the king of Jericho finds out that the spies are in the city, and he sends his men out to find them. 
And they get word that maybe Rahab the prostitute may be harboring the spies. And they were right. The, the Israelite spies come upon Rahab. And Rahab makes this unbelievable statement uh, to them when she encounters uh, the Israelite spies. She hides them up on the uh, rooftop. And when the king's men of Jericho get there, she sends them off in a different direction. And later than that night, she makes this statement. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how, you, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, and when we heard of it, uh, whom you completely destroyed. And when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. She makes a statement later. She says, I've saved you from the king of Jericho. When you come back to take this land, will you save me? And the plan was struck. You put a scarlet cord in your window. When we come back to this city, you and everyone in your house will be saved. But one of the essence of her, her statement is, we heard about what, you, what your God did to Sihon and Og. The very promise that God made Moses in the beginning was that people go and engage in battle. You have no reason to fear. In fact, the people will melt in fear because of you. At the time, Moses didn't believe it. Now we see evidence years later when Joshua is now going into Jericho. This is exactly what happened. It wasn't just the, the hearts were melting at Sihon. It was the whole region, just like God had promised. Later, the kings, married, the Israelites go into uh, to Jericho. And in Joshua chapter 3, Joshua, on the evening before they invade Jericho, makes this unbelievable statement. Joshua chapter 3, uh, uh, verse 5. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Again, what a great contrast between how Moses dealt with the situation on the eve of battle and how now Joshua views God. It'd be an understatement to say that the world hasn't changed in the last few decades. In fact, you know, when people say that America is now post-Christian, it kind of rattles all of our cages. And here on July 4th weekend, we think about those founding fathers and what they envisioned for our nation. And to see where we're at right now, probably shake them up a little bit. I used to shake up my dad after my mom passed away. My dad, we had my dad move to Arkansas. And occasionally, uh, if I didn't have anything going on at lunch, I would stop by his house at lunchtime. I'd walk in, and, uh, you know, by noon, it, especially later in his life, he, you know, not as mobile. And, uh, and so by noon, he's had four or five hours of national and international news. And his pants are on fire. So I open up the door and it's not, hello, son, how are you? How's your day? It's like, do you know what's going on today? In the middle let's not ask a lot of them let's not ask a lot of ourselves let's not engage now, I'm not calling for a mean-spirited 
finger pointing, name calling, grenade throwing kind of campaign. That will accomplish absolutely nothing. But I believe there's a way to engage. Ir Irwin McManus categorizes churches under fire, and he categorizes sometimes churches' response in three different categories. Is that in the midst of challenge, churches a lot of times respond three different ways. He said one category churches respond when pressure gets hot and when culture changes around them, they become antagonistic. They just get angry. They see the things happening around them. And there's a lot of things to be frustrated with, but they get angry. And that's one category. He said the second category sometimes is a response is when things get crazy in the culture, some churches just become apathetic. They say, well, the world's going to hell in a handbasket and we'll just hunker down right here. Let them go. Their choice. McManus, McManus says that there's a third category. It's really the apostolic calling. Is that in the midst of a changing culture, some churches respond in an apostolic way and they engage. They run into the culture with the refreshing message of Jesus Christ. We've been praying for revival for four and a half decades in America. Um, and one of the reasons why I think I'm a little bit more optimistic than my dad at times is I spent my whole life around Christian college students. And there's something particularly different, I think, emerging from this generation that's coming up. I think this generation that's emerging, although they've got lots of challenges, challenges that we mostly as their parents and grandparents have handed them, there's something refreshing about them. This may be the first generation that's coming on right now that actually believes in the priesthood of all believers. Our generation says they believe in that, but our behavior betrays us because we really still believe in the clergy. We hire ministers to carry out the work of God so we can do our own thing. This generation doesn't think that way. They're relentlessly committed to service. And they're willing to go places, quite frankly, that we have never even thought about going. And they're fearless. Forgive me for this one little tangent, but it's July 4th. If you came into my office in Montgomery, you would know within seconds that this guy right here Loves America. I mean, all over my office, there's, I mean, I've got, they say they're like toys I've got in there. I've got bust of Jefferson and Lincoln. I've got Independence Hall. Sitting on my coffee table is a copy of the Constitution. I love America. And I believe in America. But we can't vote revival into happening. Something magical is not going to happen in November, regardless of the candidate that we put forward as president. Revival will not happen in the White House. Revival happens when the people of God raise up and penetrate the culture with a refreshing message of Jesus Christ. We can't wait on Republicans or Independents or Democrats to bring about revival in America. Revival in America has to come from the people of God. It has to come from the Holy Church. And I believe we've got to engage this culture. We're living in a time of great uncertainty. But I believe the message of Isaiah 43 is a refreshing uh, promise of God that you still have to walk through the waters but they're not going to overtake us. You still have to walk through the flames. It's just that they're not going to consume you. The desert 
emerges an oasis. God says, you can find me in the wasteland. And I'll support you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. One of the great verses, I think it's around 19 and 43, it says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Do you perceive it? There's a sense that as our culture and the collapse of the Judeo-Christian culture collapses before our very eyes, there's a sense that some people, if you listen, some people act as if God has walked away. God is alive and well. And the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same spirit that lives within us. When we think about that first century church, they had no knowledge of democracy. They were peasants with no political capital. And God called them to change the world. And through his power, they did. So we, the believers of Jesus Christ, living in the United States of America in a post-Christian era, if that's what it is. No time to be afraid. No time to be angry. No time to be apathetic. Time to be apostolic. To run towards the streets of broken humanity and engage with the refreshing message of Jesus Christ. God promised that we'll travel through this barren land unscathed. Do we trust him? Do, believe, do we really believe that the Lord goes ahead of us? Are we letting our fears sterilize us? Do we look at life through the lens of Joshua that looks even at a fortified city, a quest that seems to be challenging, and look at it and say, consecrate yourself. The Lord is going to do something amazing among us. As we finish our lesson today, Scripture screams at us that regardless of the obstacles in front of us, he can see you through. Regardless of the poor decisions that we've made in our past, God can save us. The story of Rahab is a refreshing one in of itself because it seems like this insignificant lady in the story plays a part with uh, the uh, Israelite spies. But she, as you know, she pops up in Scripture again. In some pretty unlikely spots. First is Matthew chapter 1. The genealogy of Jesus Christ. Rahab the prostitute. Is mentioned as the great 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 great. I don't know how many. Grandmother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then she's in Hebrews 11. The who's who of faith. Abraham, Jacob, Isaac. And so on. And Rahab because of her faith. That part of the story reminds us. That regardless of your brokenness in life and the poor decisions that you've made your faith in God he can even use you to bring about salvation to a nation just like he did through Rahab if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ we would all beg you to do it today this is a difficult world to live in it gets even more difficult without the promises of Jesus Christ. That you give your life to him, be baptized, let him wash you of your sins. He will go before you in any challenge that you've got going forward. And then obviously, the ultimate promise, the ultimate thing that we can bank on is eternity. Eternity with him. You made poor choices. You want to be restored to the body of Christ. I feel confident as we stand and sing. If you'll come forward, the shepherds of this church will minister to you and pray for you. 
and, and, and usher you back into a relationship that's holy with Jesus. We come as we stand and sing. And you are and we are standing alone.